The legendary John Peel was one of the band's early champions, much to Harris's delight. I don't think anybody expected what, what, would, uh, what would follow from that. Not at all. I remember it was like my first record. I had to go down to Bristol. Dick said, no problems, you can go down and get them. And I, I got the first copy off the press from the first box. Certainly as soon as Peel got hold of it, he played the Kill, and then he followed it by Yusuf, and he played Yusuf three times. He said, well, I've got to play that again. <laughs> While Scum gained Napalm Death major acclaim, it did lead to a lineup change. Jim Whiteley left. Here's Mick Harris. As soon as the release came out of Scum, we went across with Ripcord to Europe for six weeks. Uh, in the back of a van, we all, we all cashed in our gyros, rented a van, we got the bass player of Sacrilege to drive us, so it would have been me, Jimmy, Lee and Bill, and then the four members of Ripcord, and they also had a friend that was sharing the driver, so there was ten of us in a little little box van, a little, little Ford box van, we threw the kits in, the amps in, and we, we, we'd set up a little basic tour, I think four or six weeks through, through Europe. Just classic tensions, touring tensions at the end of the day between me and Jim. There was no real words said, but from the offset there was a little bit of friction. Uh, I remember getting the equipment into the country. There was a little bit of a mess on the customs car and they thought when a few words were said, Jimmy took it to heart and at the end of the tour he left. It was just natural for Shane. He was my friend. Uh, I knew he could play a bit of guitar because he was writing stuff for Warhammer and Un Unseen Terror with, with, with Mitch, the multi-talented uh, Afro head. I just said, look, Shane, if you want to join Napalm. Um, the classic thing is, <laughs> he knew I loved distorted bass. He knew I loved it. You know, eventually, we had the Scott, Car what, what did we have on the back of one of many Napalm t-shirts? The Scott Carlson bass grind to her. And I just said, Shane, got to have distortion on the bass. And it was just one stipulation. It was the same. The rehearsal, three hours, me, Lee and Bill. We have this rehearsal, I remember, and Shane hadn't got any money, he got a bass, that was it. He, 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 he was adamant that he's not buying a distortion, he said, I want to hear my bass lines and I don't want it all distorted and that. And I said, well, look now, I said, you know, Shane, got to have a bit of an edge. I said, look, OK, not, not so distorted, but there's got to be some. And he, he was adamant, no, no, I don't want distortion. I said, well, look, let's go to a shop, let's try a couple out. And I had something like 40 pounds. That was it, you know what I mean? We were, we were, we, we, we were still fine, you know? Shane ended up getting this distortion pedal after trying a few out. There was one that he liked. It wasn't as vicious as some other. I was like, well, we've got to have one. So I said, yes, yeah, we'll go for that, Shane. Straight to the rehearsal room, plugged in, and it, it was just natural. Shane Embry himself recalls that he'd long been a friend and fan of the band. Well, I first met Napalm, really, is a close friend of mine, um... Mitch Dickinson met the guitar player at that time, which was Justin Broderick, in, uh, outside the Birmingham Odeon in New Street, I think around March of 86, and suggested that uh, he come along to uh, this all-day punk gig at the Mermaid in Spark Hill, Birmingham. And Napalm Death were playing alongside uh, Amoebix and a few other bands. So my friend told me, and I went along with him to the gig, and uh, that's where I first saw Napalm Death, and uh, became really good uh, friends with the guys. And then... Um, Basically started following the guys around and then um, one thing led to another, you know, a few shows, a couple of members came and went and then eventually uh, uh, they asked me to join on their uh, bass in uh, May of 87, pretty much. The new lineup wasted little time in recording the album from enslavement to obliteration in 1988, as Embury recalls. A lot of the times in those days, uh, because we all lived in separate parts of the country, um, we didn't rehearse that much. We'd rehearse for shows and, of course, for records. I think we're from, from, from enslavement. We probably rehearsed, I would say, probably <clears throat> six days maximum. And then uh, just went in and just had to bash it out really quickly. I mean, it was a lot of one takes back in those days. I mean, there wasn't the technology that you've got nowadays. And um, which I think in some ways is probably a good thing because uh, you, you, you knew you were on the spot and you had to get it done, but pretty easy going. I mean, Mickey, the drummer, was quite a <clears throat> eccentric character anyway, so you never really knew what he was going to do. And when you were recording the songs, they sometimes changed at the last minute, but um, it's very, just very quick, and um, before you knew it, the album was recorded pretty much in like three days, and then we just playing that laying down guitar tracks. Basically, that album particularly, I remember that three of us... Um, in the uh, drum room, basically all together, just bashing it out together, which you don't tend to do very much nowadays. Your 
Got me where I want you. 